We're going to continue our study in the book of Psalms with Psalm 32 today. Psalm 32. Uh, As you're turning there, I want to call your attention to the very beginning before the psalm actually starts. Uh, It says, a psalm of David, a mascal. Uh, The word that's translated mascal there means a contemplation. Uh, So Psalm 32, the material in it, actually comes from David pondering the goodness of God that he had recently experienced. So most scholars agree that Psalm 32 was written after Psalm 51. Uh, We'll get there in a couple of weeks. We're going to actually look at Psalm 51. But if you're reminded, Psalm 51 is a psalm of confession where David confesses about some things that had taken place in his life. Here's a quick review. Uh, King David, uh, one evening, noticed off in the distance a lady by the name of Bathsheba bathing. And instead of turning away, he leaned into that and he pursued her. Had uh, intimate relations with her, which produced a baby. The challenge was, is that Bathsheba was married... And that David was grossly sinning by sleeping with her. Well, he wanted to hide his sin. So he called on her husband, Uriah, who was a commander in his army, who was off at war. You can imagine some of the modern day shows like Behind Enemy Lines. Uriah would have been Behind Enemy Lines. And David didn't want to be blamed for Bathsheba's pregnancy, illegitimate pregnancy, so he brings Uriah back from war and rewards him uh, with a night with his wife. Uriah, being the honorable man uh, that he was, uh, would not share an intimate moment with his wife while his comrades were off at war. So instead of sleeping in the room with his wife, he slept outside of the room. So David's plan did not work. So he went deeper into his sin and decided that he would send Uriah back to war, send him to the front lines, and then pull the rest of the army back so that he would die in battle, which is what took place. All of this to cover up his own sin. Fast forward about 9 to 12 months, most scholars agree it was a year or almost a year that David hid these sins. And as a result, conviction would come over him in such a way that Nathan the prophet would call his sin out and then he would confess to the Lord and write that beautiful psalm that we'll get to soon, Psalm 51 where we often sing a praise chorus that comes out of Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. We sing from time to time. comes out of Psalm 51. Well, after David writes this, it appears that he's reflecting back over the goodness of God that he has known in past, but has experienced once again when he came clean with God. And then in his pondering, he gives us three things that are helpful for us to know as we move forward in life, knowing that there will be times that we will need God's forgiveness. And these three things we should consider in those moments. We're going to see the possibility of forgiveness, the pathway of forgiveness, and the privileges that come to those who've been forgiven. In each one of these things, there are a few subsets that I'll point out as we go through each one of these lessons. Before we get there, though, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the privilege of learning from David and his mistakes. I pray as we move forward in our own journey with you, 
that one, our mistakes would be minimized. They wouldn't happen so frequently. But when they do, unlike David, may we be quick to go down the road that leads to confession, lest we suffer in our own shame and our own guilt. So help us to learn from him and put into practice when needed and as needed these lessons. Thank you, Lord. Speak to us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first lesson that we're going to learn from David's contemplation is the possibility of forgiveness. We're going to see that forgiveness is possible really for anyone who would ask for it. Look at Psalm 32, verses 1 through 2. And as we work through these, we're going to see uh, that David deals with the all-encompassing issue of sin, and he uses three different words to define the condition of the human heart apart from the will of God. He uses transgression, he uses sin, and he uses iniquity. So let's work through the passage, and we'll define those. Starting in verse 1. Blessed or blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven. So so the first word he uses in the passage showing us the possibility of forgiveness. He's saying if you have transgressions in your life, you actually can be forgiven. Now what does transgressions mean? What is a transgression? It means to defy authority or to cross a line. Well, when we look back on David's journey, he had defied the authority of God. (laughs) He had crossed clear lines that God had established for the marriage bed. And he committed adultery, first and foremost, which led him to crossing the line on a number of other issues. So first we see David saying, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven. Then he goes on to say, whose sins are are covered. In the Hebrew, he uses a different word to describe disobedience. And this word, sin, translated in the English, would mean fall short or to miss the mark. So the picture here is of an archer. If you could imagine an archer taking out his arrow, putting it in the bow and shooting it at a bullseye, but the not having enough force in it, so the arrow as it's making its way to the bullseye falls a little short of the desired goal. So so the picture is, is that the desired goal is to live for God's glory. The, The desired goal is to obey God's word. The desired goal is to live like Jesus. But we as humans, in this journey with Jesus... Sometimes we go our own way, as David did, and we fall short of that mark. And no one is exempt from this. That's why in Romans 3 and 23, Paul writes, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is what was going on in David's life, and he contemplates looking back over. He says, we are forgiven whose sins are covered. And then in verse 2, He says, blessed is the one whose sin, you might circle that word, and in the King James Version or the ESV and some others, it it actually says iniquity. Blessed is the one whose sin or iniquity the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is deceit. So if you circle the word deceit and carry it back to that word sin or iniquity, it helps us understand that he's using a different word than he used just prior to this when he actually said our sins are covered. So a word that is more fitting in our language actually is iniquity. And what is an iniquity in context? It is a distortion of the truth or crookedness. And that's why it's attached in our language to the word deceit. When someone deceives someone, they distort what is true to fit their own personal agenda. And this is what David did. He distorted truth to try to hide his own deceit. So whether it be what we would classify as transgressions, whether it would be calling sins as in we fell short of God's glory, or whether it be an iniquity in that we've distorted God's truth, 
We all fall in this category at one time or another, and we need God's forgiveness. So what David was saying here, regardless of what you have done, whether it be considered a transgression, whether it be one might consider a sin, whether it be one might consider an iniquity, regardless of what you've done, forgiveness is possible. So, so I wrote a definition for me to help me understand it. I, I wrote in my notes, sin, anything that offends God in our actions or our inactions. So sin that would encompass all of those definitions would be anything that offends God, whether it be in our actions or in our inactions. When we find ourselves in our journey with Jesus, having offended God, if we want to live under the blessings that David says the scripture promises, we must come clean with God. There's a Sunday school teacher teaching on the need for confession to a younger group of students one Sunday morning, and she thought that she had made her point really, really clear that when we recognize our sin, we need to cry out for forgiveness. And she said, okay, who will remind us before we get ready to pray and go home? Who will remind us what we must do to be forgiven? Little boy's hand shot straight up, and he just started, could hardly sit in his seat Contain, contain himself and sit in a seat. He was so excited he knew the answer. The teacher looked out. She said, okay, <laughs> young man, tell me, what must we do to receive God's forgiveness? He said, first we must sin. <laughs> she said, well, you're not wrong. <laughs> you're not wrong, but that's not what I was looking for. Let's consider that we've already fallen into sin. What must we do? To receive God's forgiveness. John answers this. If you remember we studied 1 John a few months back. And in 1 John 1.8 he says. Uh, clarifying that believers. Are not exempt from making bad decisions. In the need for forgiveness. So he said if we. Claim not to have sin. We lie and the truth is not in us. So if the truth is in us. There are moments in our life where we make mistakes. It's not an excuse to go out and do something we shouldn't do. It's just a reality that we're fallen people and that fallen people are not perfected this side of heaven. Heaven, So we make mistakes or sin, fall short of God's glory, miss the mark, distort the truth at times. And when we do this, we learn in 1 John 1, 9, the key to that forgiveness, making that possibility a reality. If we confess our sins. If we confess our sins. John starts by saying, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So to turn this possibility into a reality, we must first acknowledge before God that we have sinned. So first, there's the possibility of forgiveness. Secondly, we see the pathway of forgiveness. Now, the pathway, the longer we take on this pathway, the more painful the pathway will be. Because in this pathway, we're going to see a wasting away, a weighing down, and a wearing out. Look first at wasting away in verse 3. David writes, when I kept silent, that means when I did not confess, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Now, now, David wasn't saying, literally speaking, that his bones started disappearing. But analogously, he was speaking about the pain that he experienced emotionally and spiritually. It even affected him physically. I don't know if you've ever hidden a sin uh, in your life in such a way as David did to where you would experience pain, but I have known folks that have walked a season in sin, and the moment they confessed their sin, it was like a weight was taken off their shoulders. Even in my own journey, there have been moments where I've tried to hide a mishap. And I sense and feel the pain that's self-inflicted. 
There is freedom in confession. Wasting away. Secondly, we see weighing down. Look at verse 4. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Uh, we all know what that feels like, right? Just a day or two ago, we had summer and winter in the same day. So we got the feeling of summer as well as the fall or winter in the same day. We, we know what it feels like to walk through a summer day in Oklahoma and feel like we're being beat up. It's so hot. We can literally see the heat rising off of the pavement. David is saying that when we walk in our sin, just like on a hot day, how sluggish we might feel, we might sense the hand of God weighing us down. In New Testament language, we call that the conviction of the Holy Spirit. In John 16, as we read through parts of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, one is that he would convict us in regard to sin and righteousness. So as we move away from right living with God's help and we go our own way, the Spirit of God that lives with inside of us, Ephesians 1 and 13 tells us when we believe we're sealed in him with the promised Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God brings conviction. And that conviction is designed not for us to live in the pain of feeling weighed down. That conviction is designed to point us back to God. It's to show us our need for Him in our daily lives. There's a wasting away, a wearing down. And then there's a wearing out. Look at verse 5. After experiencing this internal pain and the conviction of the Holy Spirit, David writes, Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquities. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And I encourage you to underline this last part. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Notice it says, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, the punishment of your sin has already been done away with. That was taken care of at the cross. That's why Jesus cried from the cross to tell us that it is finished. The price for sin has already been paid. Our past sin, our present sin, if we find ourselves walking in a bad situation because of our own idiocy, or in future sin, when we will miss the mark. It's already been paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why Paul wrote in Romans 8 and 1. Therefore, and if you go back and look at it, canonically, in that passage, if you go back before, he's talking about Jesus died for our sins. And then he says, therefore, there is no condemnation. That means the wrath of God poured out on sin and the sinner. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If we're in Christ, the punishment, the ultimate punishment of our sin has been done away with. But that doesn't mean we'll experience the guilt. Or we won't be devoid of walking in shame. When we make decisions apart from God's perfect plan for our life. So as a believer, when we come and we confess to the Lord of our sin, our transgressions, or our iniquities, we can be sure that God's already taken care of the wrath, but he will even forgive us, as David says, the guilt of our sin. And guilt can be like a prison. I, I learned of a story this past week of a young man. I, I believe, if I remember right, he was about high school age. Incredible athlete, and he had been invited uh, by the Olympic Committee to come to an Olympic trial, to try out for the Olympics. The man came from very little, and he didn't have the type of clothes that he needed or the money to travel that he needed. So he concocted a plan to steal this money from his boss. Not a very wise plan. He was going to go in early. This was back before we had uh, these things and cameras everywhere. So he was going to go back, go in early when he knew that his boss would get there before everyone and spend some time reading at his desk. He was going to get there. He was going to walk in. 
He was going to hold the man down, hit him over the back of the head if he needed to, just to get him not to look back. He was going to reach in his pocket and take money because he knew the man carried a wad of cash in his pocket every day. The man was very generous and would often help people out. When I heard this story, I thought if he was very generous and helped people, why didn't you just ask him for the money? But instead, maybe embarrassed, this guy said that he was just going to go in and take it. He was going to leave, wait a little while, come to work as if nothing had happened so that he wouldn't get in trouble and he would have this money. When he went in, I don't remember all of the details, but I remember it shocked the man. The man realized that he was coming in and started to fight back. So the young man hit him over the head much harder than he initially intended. And as a result, the man dropped dead. The young man ran out, and like he had planned, he came back a little while later to work, found the man there, made the report, and for over a decade, the police found no clues. For over a decade, this guy got away with this crime, and now he's in his late 20s. But inside, there was a wasting away, and there was a wearing out. the, The guilt and the shame was so heavy upon him that he turned himself in. And he would spend life in prison, and somebody asked him, behind the prison bars, why, after a decade, did you turn yourself in? He said the prison of guilt was far greater than the bars that I currently reside behind. Friend, I want you to know... (laughs) When we're going down the pathway of forgiveness and we finally just open up to God and say, I'm sorry. He already knows. He just wants to hear it from us. When we say, I'm sorry, this is what I've done and I'm wrong, forgive me. The shame, the guilt begins to go away. And if the devil ever reminds you of it, I encourage you to say what one lady said as she knew that that voice speaking in her head about her past that she had confessed to God did not come from God. It could only be Satan himself. When she thought of this, she said, you go east. And she said the voice came back again about her guilt and her shame. She said, you go west. And the voice came back again. And she said, you go east and you go west. And someone asked her, why in the world would you tell Satan to go east and to go west? She said, because my Bible says that my sins have been forgiven as far as the east is from the west and that God will remember them no more. So it's not God who's bringing it up in my past, about my past. It's the devil. And I will not let him have victory. The possibility of forgiveness available to you and me. Available to anyone who will call upon his name. The pathway of forgiveness. It can be very painful. So let it be a short pathway. (laughs) Just come clean when the spirit convicts you of it. Third and final thing we see in David's contemplation. The privileges of forgiveness. The privilege of forgiveness. These few verses are filled with five privileges. It's not an exhaustive list. But it's certainly privilege David was reminded of when he confessed to the Lord. We'll see presence, protection, provision, peace, and also praise. First, let's look at presence. Beginning in verse 6. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Key word is found. Please hear me on this. If there's distance between you and God because of your sin, it's not because he went anywhere. (laughs) It's because you're hiding in your own sin. Think back to Adam and Eve. Remember when the voice of the Lord spoke what they did? They went and hid. Why? That is a natural response. The supernatural response is to lean into God's presence. Here are a couple of verses to remind you of how important this is. Proverbs 8 and 17 In James 4 and 8, listen to Proverbs 8 and 17, the Lord's words. I love those who love me and those who seek me, find me. Just look up. Just look up. He is there. James says, come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. 
What does James remind us? We take the first step. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Seek God and he will be found. Remember his presence is only a prayer away. As we confess, the Lord reminds us that he is with us. Second thing we see in these verses is protection. The privilege of protection. Look at the last part of Verse 6 and also verse 7. Surely the rising of mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Remember when we confess to the Lord and our relationship is stored, that puts us back under. And we've used this illustration before. that that, That puts us back under the umbrella of God's protection. If you'll remember, when we're walking with Jesus, we can be sure that he is protecting us. When we get away from Jesus, there is no guarantee of protection. So as we forgive, or as we confess to the Lord and he forgives, he brings us back under that umbrella of protection. Here are some verses of comfort. Hebrews 13 and 5b, the second half. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Remember, God is here. That's why when the Lord Jesus, his birth was announced, he was called Emmanuel, which means God with us. He ultimately never leaves us. Romans 8 and 31b, if God be for us, who can be against us? We sang about that earlier in one of the songs. That's the text that comes from Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. The protection of God is on his people And when we're confessed up, we walk under and in his protective care. Next, we see provision. Look at verse 8. David writes, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit or bridle, or they will not come to you. So what did David need at this time? He needed the wise counsel of God. David needed the instructions of God. Why? Because he was living by his own set of rules. He was living by his own set of boundaries. He was living by his own instructions. What he was lacking was clear direction which God gives us in his word. So as David recounts back, He says, I needed your counsel. I needed your instruction. I'm not sure what need you have in your life today, but what I do know is God is the great provider. And that when we're walking with him, we can be sure that he meets our every need. Now, I want to qualify that because sometimes we think we need things that we really don't need. Humanly speaking, we would call those greeds. God's word promises that he will meet our every need, but it does not teach that he will give us our every greed. But we can be sure that he will provide for us what we need and when we need it. Do you remember the Apostle Paul? He said he knew what it was like to have a lot, and he knew what it was like to have absolutely nothing. And to summarize that theme, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, he writes this. And my God will meet all of your needs according to his riches in the glory of the Lord Jesus. So we can be sure that he will meet our every need. Next thing in the passage, we see the privilege of peace. One of the privileges of forgiveness is peace to the individual who has confessed. Look at verse 10. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts him. How can we be sure that we can be wrapped in the love of God and experience the peace that flows from this wrapping? When we confess to him, the scripture teaches as David contemplates what he's experienced in his own freedom, and that is the peace of God. In Philippians 4, 6, and 7, Paul writes about the peace of God. 
And he literally says it transcends human understanding. How do we get it? If you back up into Philippians 4 and 6, he says by prayer and petition. Specifically in this context, it would be the prayer of confession. God, I failed you. I've done wrong. I went my own way. Forgive me. And at the moment, God begins to bring peace back into our life. The greatest level of peace we'll ever experience is walking closely with the Lord Jesus. Walking under the umbrella of his protection, knowing that he'll meet our every need. He is our great provider. Final thing we see is the privilege of praise. Look at verse 11. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. The ability to praise God comes from a clean heart. That, that's why in Psalm 51 we'll get to, uh, David said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. When we're walking close with the Lord, we're experiencing the joy of his salvation. It cannot help but to come out. What's inside? will ultimately show up on the outside. Life happens. It's like the pressure pot. I don't know if you've ever, I, I, this is a South Carolina thing, so I learned when I moved out to Oklahoma 10 years ago, boiled peanuts. I understand that's not necessarily a big pastime here, but where I grew up, boiled peanuts were a big thing. We used to literally go out to the fields and pick our own peanuts. We would bring them back, we would clean them off, and we would put them in a pressure pot. And how do we know the pre when it was done? When what was inside started to come outside. Now, what I mean by that, the hot water, you have to boil them. And people go, why do you boil peanuts? No, really, they're actually pretty good. But you would boil them, and then the steam would come out of the pot, and it would start whistling to let us know what was ready. The heat hit, the steam came out. The heat hit, the steam came out. In life, life happens. Well, what comes out? Whatever's inside. If we're walking closely with Jesus, there's praise inside. I'll praise you through the storm, that song we sometimes sing. I'll praise you in the morning. I'll praise you in the valleys, just like on the mountaintop. Whatever's inside is what comes out. And what David is saying here is that we confess to the Lord and we start really walking with him. When life happens, the pressure comes on, then praise will come out. As we close, I have a question, and I, I want you to answer this in the silence of your own heart. Do you need his forgiveness today? Now, now, please hear me. I'm not talking about salvation at the moment. I'm talking about people who know God, who love God, but have made a decision or decisions that weren't pleasing to the Lord, and for some reason you're walking today in guilt and shame. I want you to know those are two things that you don't have to walk with. <laughs> if, like David, you come to him, the possibility of forgiveness is real for you. You just say, God, and share with him what's on your heart. And then he will begin to give you the privileges that we spoke of. You'll sense his presence. You'll experience his protection, his provision. You'll recognize, and you'll praise him. You'll praise him. Why? Because it'll be a natural response to the forgiveness, the overwhelming flood that he offers those who call upon his name. I'm going to ask you, if you know the Lord and love the Lord, but have gotten a little off course, confess to him today and walk out of here, leaving guilt and shame right where you are. And take the power from knowing his presence. Now, I would also say that if you walked in today and you don't know Jesus, and what you need is the ultimate forgiveness. And you need to be forgiven of your sins so that you can have salvation and you can walk out of here knowing that one day your home would be heaven. I would encourage you to make that decision today as well. Whatever it is that God leads you to do, be open to the work of his spirit in your life today. Let's pray together.